those IEP essentials. Awesome. Let's give a few minutes for, for some folks to get in. We're also live streaming on Facebook if anyone's interested in that. Want to let your folk, let your friends and family <laughs> know about our live stream on on Facebook. Give it a few more minutes here, folks. Straggling in. Hey, looks like most most folks are here. Welcome, welcome everyone. Um, sit down, grab your sandwich out of the bag, open that box, box that a bag of chips, and uh, sit back. Get ready to take some notes if we want to. Um, pretty sure this is being recorded, so it might be an opportunity to uh, view later. Um, welcome to the Peel Center. Uh, my name is Cindy Dooch. I'm the director of um, individual assistance. And with me, partner in crime, Jane Stadnick, our family resource specialist over here in the West. Um, so we're the Peel Center Parent Education Advocacy Leadership, the Parent Training and Information Center for Pennsylvania. Um, you know what, let me share my screen so we can show you what we're doing here. One second. We've noticed some internet lags this morning. So be patient, we'll get through everything. Jane and I are on a strict schedule. <laughs> okay. We always like to begin with the mission of the Peel Center. And that is to educate and empower families to ensure that children, youth and young adults with disabilities and special health care needs lead rich, active lives as full members of their schools and communities. So we're gonna start out with a poll because they're fun. Uh, we wanna know what brings you here today? Is it uh, that you've had a request for an IEP evaluation and that was made by the teacher or the school that you requested an IEP evaluation for your child? You already have an IEP for your child and like to learn more. Not sure if an IEP or some other kind of support at school is needed. And um, I see there's some advocates on here too. So uh, answer in what makes you comfortable. Okay, everybody have everything in? We'll go ahead and end that poll. Um, Anya, I hope you're watching because I'm hoping that when I end the poll, that'll show up for folks so they can see it. Nope, here's your results, okay. So it looks like um, most of you already have an IEP for your child and you wanna learn more. Um, and that's, you know, fantastic because there's always opportunity to learn more. I think Jane and I would tell you, you know, that we're always learning something um, and um, always, always good to know. Good to know more. Okay, so we'd like to let you know what we're going to talk about, what we what we want you to be able to gain from today's training. Um, I will mention too that um, because we're in a we are in a strict time schedule here. It's you know one hour. We want to get through everything, and that we're going to keep personal issues um, more private. If you want to call Jane or I or any of our um, 
you know, family resource specialists at the Peel Center talk one-on-one. -on -one. We can give you a lot more detailed information if you um, want to give us a call. We'll put our email addresses in the chat box. Um, it's just a better way to get through the training. Um, so we're going to do that by describing the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, and educational rights, um, what the law mandates for all kids. Describe the individual education program process, the team, and the document itself. Discuss ways that families can provide meaningful input throughout the IEP process. Um, just about anything you can share about your child is going to be meaningful. Um, and we'll um, give you an opportunity to ask questions related to the process after the presentation is done. So we start out with, you know, what are the key principles of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act um, that, you know, why do we have the IDEA? Why do we have IEPs? Um, disability is a natural part of the human experience and in no way diminishes the right of the individual to participate in or contribute to society. This is written in the law. And um, as a matter of fact, any kind of disability law that comes from the federal government now um, has this statement in it because this is what we base it on. Um, it's, you know, in some way, everyone's affected. In some way, um, the majority of us are going to be uh, you know, affected by disability, um, whether by accident or age. So it's natural. And those with disabilities are part of the fabric of our communities. Um, you know, and the IDEA is a civil rights law. Um, so Congress was able to open the public school doors for millions of children with disabilities when IDEA was passed. So this is key to understanding what our kids' rights are, or understanding these principles of IDEA. Some other principles of IDEA are the parents should be informed decision makers. This is so key. Um, in fact, there's a lot of times when I'm, you know, either um, helping out parents and using this as a reason to um, sometimes get information that you need from your school. Um, you may feel that the school's not sharing information that you should have access to or that you need to know. So the fact that you're entitled by the law to be an informed decision maker um, will be a, a gateway into getting that information you need. Um, IDEA guarantees access to a free, appropriate, public education for all kids in special education. So free, meaning that, you know, you shouldn't have to drive them. You shouldn't have to provide um, assistive technology for them. You shouldn't have to provide the accommodations that they need. That should be given to them as part of their free appropriate public education. Appropriate, um, that's where sometimes it's a little gray and that's why we have dispute resolution to be able to resolve those disputes where, um, you know, there's, there's a tough time getting agreement between the school, um, the school and the um, family. And children with disabilities should be educated with their non-disabled peers to the maximum extent appropriate in the least restrictive environment. This must begin, this is a statement that if you take a look at your notice of uh, recommended educational placement, prior written notice, this statement is right on there that every team has to first consider, every team first consider the gen ed classroom in the school they would go to if they did not have a disability with all the supports and services they need to be successful in a gen ed classroom. And the reason for this, research. Um, research is showing us that kids who with disabilities who are educated in their gen ed environments are more challenged they're learning more. There's no low, bo low bar that's set. Um, they are challenged, the same as any other child is challenged um, when they go to school. Um, and we now have research that shows that um, kids do not learn more or learn better in segregated or even small groups. And that 
typical peers do benefit from having kids with disabilities in their classrooms. Moving on, the um, supplementary aids and services. And, and this is what ensures that um, kids are getting the support that they need in the gen ed classroom. Um, they have to be considered. And you know anything that the parent brings up in, a, in an IEP meeting should be considered um, by the team. And there's a statement, we'll go through this a little later, but there's you know four statements that the IEP team has to consider when we talk about including a kid in the gen ed environment and are they getting all the supports and services they need. Um, so these are you know in place to support the learning and participation in both gen ed classrooms and extracurricular activities. You might say, whoa, wait a minute, extracurricular activities? Yeah, extracurricular activities. Your child has a right to participate in school-sponsored activities with supports and services. So let's say your child wants to um, participate in the school play. They have that right, same as any other child. But if they need some support there, let's say they need someone to help keep them on task, then that has to be provided there. Um, you know, so uh, my son was, uh, you know, we, we did some planning and in fourth grade talked about, you know, what, What's his high school, what are his high school years going to look like? And he really enjoyed music. So one of the things that we did was get him, um, you know, fourth grade is when a lot of kids are um, trying out instruments in school, right? Um, and even third grade sometimes for those string instruments. So, you know, he, he tried the trumpet that I remember them saying, well, he gets sound out of it and that's all they have to do. So he was able to get sound out of it and he learned how to play the trumpet. By the time he was in ninth grade, he was ready for the marching band. And that was probably one of the best experiences that he had in his high school years. And think about your own experiences. You know, you don't remember that great geometry class, do you? No, you remember, you know, the time that everybody got together and decorated for prom or whatever. You remember those kind of experiences and it's important for our kids too. Supplementary aids and services are available to all students who need them and designed to provide meaningful educational benefit and provide it in a manner that avoids stigmatizing students. Um, you know, this it, confidentiality is is part of special education too. And there's no reason to be calling out, um, you know, needs that a child has or um, classrooms. There shouldn't be classroom doors that say learning support classroom. That's just not appropriate. Um, so I see that we have a, um, we have a link for um, Pat in Pennsylvania. Training and Technical Assistance Network is really great in providing, um, I am going way too slow, Jane. Um, Patent.net has a lot of information that um, can be provided to families. Um, just browse the, it's not a difficult um, website to navigate. Just browse through there for some, um, a lot of help in navigating special education. So let's get to the process. The process. So this is kind of the order that things go in. First, there's a referral, either from the family or from the school. Um, the evaluation, eligibility determination, the IEP development. And only when those things are done, can we talk about where is that going to take place for the child? Do we talk about educational placement? So you have to have the evaluation done, you have to have the IEP done because we need to know what the child needs. And only then do we talk about, well, where's that going to happen? So the lastly, we talk about educational placement. The IEP is implemented. There's an annual review. Team has to meet no less than once a year. Can meet many times after that, but must meet once a year. And there's reevaluation. Reevaluation is every three years for students except for students with intellectual disability who have reevaluation every two years and that reevaluation cannot be waived. So moving on, good IEP starts with a good evaluation. So it, it, 
it includes input and perspectives from a variety of professionals. We're not just going to have one person sit down and go through the entire evaluation with the child. It has to come from various places. We're doing an evaluation based on suspected disability. You don't have to have you know, a piece of paper from the doctor that says, this child is diagnosed with this. Anything that you feel as a parent is a concern you should bring up with the school. And this is even after, you know, if you're getting ready for um, a triennial evaluation, you know, one of those evaluations that takes place every three years, and you notice something that's going on, bring it up because, you know, the school would have to evaluate based on suspected disability. Uh, and we need to hear from the family. They, the school, the IEP team needs to hear from families as far as what works for the child, what you know the child responds to, those are all really important. It has to be multidisciplinary. What's that? Just like we mentioned, includes input and perspective from a variety of professionals, gen ed teachers, special education teachers, speech, language OT, depending on the needs of the child and the suspected disability. Um, when the evaluation report is finished, um, it'll be available to the family within 60 calendar days. And again, that doesn't include the summer. So during the school year, available in 60 calendar days. Um, there's no wiggle room, 60 calendar days. Um, and it has to be available to families in the language that you use or in the mode of communication you use. Um, again, this is non-negotiable. This is what the law says. You're entitled to a non-discriminatory evaluation. This is in procedural safeguards. Um, <coughs> excuse me. A variety of assessment tools has to be used to look at the functional, um, academic, developmental needs of the student. Um, you know, we're talking about the whole student. Um, for example, if, you know, a child with autism, we're not just going to look at the academic needs, but what are the social needs for the child? What are the behavioral needs for the child? Um, depending on the needs of the student, we could be looking at other things too. So again, it's supposed to be individualized, um, must include information from the family. Anytime um, that you have an opportunity to give information to the school, I would do it. And even if the opportunity is not presenting himself, but there's something you need them to know, um, I would share that with them. Um, first rule in advocacy, keep it in writing. So I would keep it in writing, email's fine, um, but it should always be including information that you feel is important, um, whether it's at an evaluation report, at um, an annual meeting, then, you know, let's say you get an outside report and that outside report might be more thorough it, only because it might look at, you know, a school evaluation is only going to be education based. It's not looking at anything else but educational need. But you might have an outside report that gives a whole lot more information. You can share that information with the school. And any outside report has to be considered by the IEP team. That's the word that's used in the law, considered. Um, so they can't just toss it. Um, they should be looking at it. Um, the parent or the student may request, or the parent or the district may request the evaluation. Um, either one. There's really generally not a reason the district should say no, but if that happens, call an appeal center, right? Okay. Um, should be a minister without racial cultural bias. So if you do need, um, it to be written and not just, you know, so many times, most of forms um, that you can find on the patent website are um, translated so that, you know, they are in the language that families use. But a lot of times the content's not. So you want to be sure that both the content and the form itself are in a language that the family uses so that they can understand what's happening. So we talk about eligibility, who's eligible for IEP or special education services. Um, we often say that it's two pronged, meaning two things have to happen. One is that the child has to um, have an IDEA category disability. 
and we'll share those with you in one second. And also the need for specially designed instruction. So the student has to meet one of these 13 disability categories and be in need of special, specially designed instruction. Um, there is Pennsylvania guidance for um, IEP and 504 agreements. And um, I think Sue, might have that link that you can put into the chat to help families. These are the categories that we're looking at. Um, intellectual disability, hearing impairment, speech or language impairment, visual impairment, emotional disturbance. I think, uh, you know, we have gotten so far in our evolution of language that we have um, reused intellectual disability to replace words that had been used previously. I think the next, the next um, category we're gonna see some work on is maybe emotional disturbance because um, it's just a, a little bit offensive in the language. Um, orthopedic impairment, autism, traumatic brain injury, other health impairment. Other health impairment is kind of a catch-all for, um, for other disabilities that may not fit in these other categories. So this would include, let's say, ADHD, ADD. Those could be considered under other health impairment. Specific learning disability. This does include dyslexia. So if you believe your child has dyslexia, be sure to mention that um, it is a specific learning disability and there are specific markers that are looked for when a school does an evaluation. Um, they might tell you that that's a medical term, but what the federal government, you know, United States Department of Ed says is that if that term um, can be used to help the team figure out what the student needs, then they have to use the term. So there's nothing against using the term. Deafness, deaf blindness, and multiple disability. So what is an IEP? What is an individualized education program? It's actually a written statement that is created, reviewed, and revised by the IEP team. Um, remember parents, you are, I have a friend who says she's the CEO of her child's IEP team. Um, you know, if meetings are being held, they have to be held at, at your convenience. Um, they have to, the, the team has to consider first what, what is agreeable to the parent as far as meeting the IEP. Um, there's mandated members. All of those people have to be at the meeting. Um, and if they can't be, then, um, you can either agree and say, fine, they'll have you sign a waiver, but that person still has to provide written input, um, or you don't have to agree. You, know, you can say, you know, that, that doesn't work. I need to have that person here and let's meet at a different time. Um, important reminder, it's both a process and a document. Um, it's a legally binding document. It's a living document, meaning that it can be changed at any time. There's no one time when it's set in stone. Um, so it's a, it's a living document. It can be changed at any time. Um, you don't have to have a meeting always to, to have an, IE, to change an IEP. If you, and let's say the special education teacher, um, agree on, let's say an accommodation that's going to be added, all that teacher has to do is make sure it's okay with the local education agency rep. They should be able to see that person and talk to them and explain that, you know, them and the family made a decision and they can okay it. Doesn't have to, have, you don't have to bring everybody together. Um, and always, it has to be created and implemented and developed um, in collaboration with the families. So here's the members of the IEP team that we typically see. The first four are mandated, they're in the law. Those folks have to be there. So we have the parent or the guardian or the person that is acting on the child's behalf. Um, a general education teacher, um, even if the student is maybe not in special education or in general education classrooms, we still wanna know, you know, if it's a third grade student, what are third graders doing? We need to have that teacher there. It's important for that person to be there. And, you know, um, it's always important 
Jane and I and the, the Peel Center are, are very strongly um, promote inclusive education. Um, so we need to have that input from the regular education teacher to let us know what kids are doing and, you know, no kid has to earn their way into a gen ed classroom, but what's going on in that third grade classroom, we need to know from that special that general education teacher, a special education teacher, so that they that person can support a gen ed teacher in the classroom. Um, and let us know, you know, how the child might be doing, or maybe they're co-teaching, and both of them together can, you know, help the team um, decide on, you know, supports and services for the child. Local education agency representative. Local education agency only refers to the school. So we have to have a person who is a representative of the school who can make financial decisions for the school. So if an IEP team is talking about, let's say a one-on-one -on -one parent educator for the student, we can't have the team sitting there saying, oh, you know what, we got to check with so-and-so because they have to, they, you know, they, they make that decision, not us. No, we have to have that person right there because this team's talking about what this child needs. So that the school has to be able to say at that meeting, yes or no. And so the person who is acting as the LEA has to have the ability to make those decisions. If they don't have the ability to make those decisions, they're not the LEA rep. So, you know, we, there's no, oh, let's go talk to Ms. Smith about that. Mm -mm. It has to be decided then and there. That's the purpose of the LEA. A person who can interpret evaluation res results, um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of times the, the reports, I just read one that was very technical and that, that really, it's not fair to the family um, because, you know, I didn't go to school to be a school psychologist, so I don't know what a lot of that stuff means. So somebody has to be there to say, what does that mean? Put it in, you know, terms that I can understand it. Again, you have that right to be a fully informed decision maker. That means you understand the evaluation results. Um, others with knowledge or expertise. So on both the school side and on your side, this is anybody who either side has determined has knowledge or expertise. So let's say you wanna bring your, um, you know, your good friend who knows something about special education or really just somebody to support you. Maybe you need somebody to take notes. Um, truthfully, you can bring anybody who you want to bring to that meeting. Um, if it is somebody who can provide you know, emotional support to you, if it's somebody who's going to take notes for you, that's your decision. Um, the only, the only you know, place where we draw the line here is a an attorney. You can't bring an attorney with you. But you know, um, I used to try and make this funny and say, oh, you can bring the garbage man with you. But you know what, it's serious. And um, the school can't, can't keep us from bringing in who we need to have there. Um, when, appropriate, when appropriate, the student should be invited to the meeting. And, you know, at, at 14 years old in Pennsylvania, um, that's when we start talking about transition services and transition to adult. So at 14, students are um, mandated to come to their, to be invited to their meetings, not come, to be invited to their meetings. Um, you know, Jane and I had our son start early. Um, Andrew, my son started when he was in fifth grade. Now he didn't, you know, participate in the entire meeting. Um, who wants to do that, right? So he would participate in like 15 minutes. You know, that's what that's what he was comfortable with. Um, ahead of time, we would put on index cards. Yeah, that was back in the day. We used index cards. <laughs> uh, he would, you know, what he felt strengths were, what he was good at, um, what he felt his needs were. Um, what he can be supported in, and then um, a goal that he wanted. In sixth grade, he wanted to learn how to talk to girls. It, if I were talked about that, it might have sounded a little funny or something, but he was, you know, he was serious. This was something he wanted to do, learn how to talk to girls. Um, sure enough, the IEP team, seeing that, you know, the interest that this was for him as an individual student, they put it in the IEP. 
Um, so, you know, think about that, about having your student, and it helps with self-advocacy, self-determination. It helps them being comfortable. Um, Andrew's speaking in front of uh, Senator Casey next week. He's ecstatic, but he can do this because in fifth grade, he was speaking at his IEP meetings, and it made him comfortable speaking in front of folks and being able to, um, to participate in these meetings, even though there's a whole adult, bunch of adults around. Um, participation, again, like we said just a little earlier, can be waived with parental consent. So on my last slide, I'm gonna let you know that um, the IEP has two main purposes, to identify measurable, observable, Jane's gonna go through that some more, goals for your child, and to clearly identify what services, supplementary aids and services that the school district is going to provide for your child in writing. Um, legal document, you can't say no. Um, and you know, the, so the, the crux of this is how your child's going to access the general education curriculum. Doesn't mean they have to be on grade level, just how they're going to access the curriculum in a way that's meaningful for them. Extracurricular activities, that's important. And non-academic school-related activities, field trips, assemblies, things like that. Jane, looks like you are up. All right, Cindy, we're actually um, on the procedural safeguards. So these are our parental rights and um, you get this at your IEP meeting. You should have it yearly. Um, a lot of times there's a joke made and we get so many of these, we could pay for our bathroom. But it, in, in reality, these are our rights. This is how we uh, disagree with decisions that our districts may be making for our children. So procedural safeguards, um, know your rights. There should be a, this is the link for it. We can add it in the chat. Um, and before we move on to the sections of the IEP, um, there was a question about um, bringing an attorney to an IEP meeting. Um, and, and as a parent, you can, and you would have to let the school know in advance. And if you bring an attorney, the school district is going to bring an attorney. And what we often say is then the attorneys talk, right? When your IEP is about your student's individualized education program and it's about your input and your students input and their team's input not about the input of your attorneys so um although attorneys can be valuable when it comes to mediation and due process um your iep team meeting should be a conversation about what supports your child and what they need for their education so just wanted to cover that before we moved on. Okay, Cindy, we can go ahead to the sections of the IEP. Can you get that to move forward? There we go. So again, um, the sections of the IEP. So the IEP document has several sections. We're gonna go kind of do a broad dive into each of these sections. Um, there is a deeper dive on P-A-T-T-A-N. Um, again, the, our link will, will be in there in your chat and we can um, cover as much as we have in the time we have. If you have questions that don't get answered on here, again, Cindy and I will put our email in at the end of the chat. Uh, we also have an info at peelcenter.org that uh, we both manage, so if you need to get that um, to us, we will gladly answer any questions, especially if they're personal questions. So we always start with the demographics, the team meeting information. I'm always taken back by sometimes the demographics are incorrect. Um, so I look at several IEPs per year and the wrong phone number is on them. And then when something happens, we don't have the right phone number listed. So even on the parent side, please make sure, I know we want to get into the guts of the IEP, but please make sure your demographics are correct because the school is using them to get a hold of you. 
um, the present levels of academic performance and functional performance, um, transition services, your child's participation in assessments, um, goals and objective, um, any related services, supplementary aids and services or program modifications will be listed in the IEP, the educational placement and Penn data reporting. We can go on to the next one. So we're gonna start with the first section, which was present levels of academic and functional performance. Um, this is where your baseline data lives, right? So we talk about often that you'll have the evaluation um, that's in there, make sure that it is present levels. So we're talking about the here and now. There are some great background information, but if your kid is in ninth grade and you still have information about kindergarten in there, that's not present. So remember present levels of academic and functional performance. And, and the reason I say that is oftentimes um, when our children are young, we have some, uh, um, you know, kindergarten, first grade type behaviors that they no longer have in ninth grade. So just keep in mind that read through your present levels of academic and functional performance um, and make sure that that stuff is present, that the baseline data matches the evaluation that you have. Um, Cindy, you can go to the next slide because this is where I'm gonna talk about in that um, present levels of academic performance are your parental concerns. And this by far is the most important part of this section your parental concerns. Um, I often hear families call in and they talk about all of these concerns that they have for their students and they're not listed in the, sec in the section of the IEP. So any concerns that you have are listed in this present levels under parent concerns has to be talked about during your IEP meeting. So even if it's the littlest thing, like, you know, I'm worried about my child's use of a pencil or a pencil grasp, right? Because what that does is it triggers the team to have a discussion about that in case you forget, right? I know when I go into my son's IEP meeting, I've got like a hundred things going through my mind. Write them down, check them off when you talk about them because that's part of where this concerns is. And we keep talking about it, talking about it. And actually, in his next IEP meeting, because as parents, we always have that five-year plan where the IEP is based on that one-year plan, you can revisit. Did the, you know, pencil grasp resolve itself? Did we add assistive technology for it? All of that will be listed here in your parental concerns and you can review it at the next IEP meeting. Cindy, next one. Again, present levels, this is part of those, uh, you know, your chance to provide information about starting of your child's school day, right? From the beginning, when your child either gets on the bus or gets to school, till that child goes home. Make sure this information is part of those present levels because we want all of the stuff that's in the present levels to be connected to the goals and objectives in the child's IEP. Um, you know, what are some skills that your child needs to work on um, to have a successful school experience? So all of these things in these present levels, you know, what are we working on this? What are we, what are we going to work on this year? How are we going to achieve it? So your present levels will connect to your goals and objectives, Cindy. Next session would, section would be transition services. Again, we're going over a broad view of this. Um, there are three areas in transition service. There is post-secondary education, employment, and community participation. Um, questions an IEP team may ask is, you know, how will the IEP reflect appropriate transition assessment and data, right? Is there documentation like, has the student been invited to the IEP? Because this is where it's important. I don't wanna talk about what my child wants to do after he gets out of high school or what he wants to do 
for a job, we need his input on that. Um, and, and another thing is, as you're talking about these transition services, who is going to um, be responsible for coordinating these transition activities? Like these things should be listed in the IEP. Um, another thing that I think a lot of families tend to miss um, when we look at transition services, um, does the student require assistance with things like personal safety, protection from abuse, self-advocacy, or self-awareness? These can all be listed under the transition services. Cindy, the next one, again. Um, per, in October 2020, the revision to Act 26 questions. Um, this must be, this data must be collected from the IEP document. Um, so each individual student's IEP, there may be a no response to these questions, but they're required to answer them. So again, in the summary of academic and functional performance, they'll be asked and documented. Again, another one of these um, is upon exiting high school, right? We're collecting data. Was a student employed in a competitive integrated setting? So this is data that we're now collecting to make sure that our transition services and that our students are prepared for life after high school. Go ahead, next. Ah, oh, measurable annual goals, right? This is how, this is the, the meat and potatoes, right? Um, Goals and objectives must be specific, observable, and measurable, meaning we need to understand how the child is going to meet that goal. And we have to be able to measure it with data. The data is not, he did great this nine weeks. We want real data based on the actual goal. Um, again, there's a link in here. It talks about uh, writing effective IEP goals. You know, we wanted to describe what the student will be able to do, what it will look like, how it will be measured, and how frequently. And I want to touch on the be able to do, right? Often we see goals that say student will not, you know, have an outburst or student will be compliant. I, I want the skill that the student is going to do, right? the student's going to follow directions, right? The student is going to use coping skills when presented with a situation, right? So what skill do we want the student to do? Next. Okay. Services and supports. Um, this is your specific, um, specially designed instruction. This is how we have access to um, it meets the needs of your child, right? Um, support the skills needed in transition and secondary. What do we need to support the student in obtaining their goals, um, obtaining their transition goals? Um, you know, I, again, there's an example, a child with autism engages with his daily academic schedule for the use of visual supports, in alternate modes of communication, sensory materials, plant opportunities for social engagement. Like, so this is how he's going to engage in his daily academic schedule. It tells you it's going to use visual supports. They're going to use alternate modes of communication, sensory materials, and planned opportunities. Next. Um, again, supplemental aids and services. Um, again, it's about access, both the educational and non-academic related activities. Remember those um, bands, field trips, um, whatever your child needs to access, what are they going to need? Um, you know, how are we going to adapt the content, the delivery of instruction? Um, you know, they're not necessarily meant to take the place of teaching, right? You're just trying to make access happen, right? Um, what does he need? Like a larger desk um, to hold the keyboard display, you know, does a child need extended time, special seating, 
um, you know, specialized paper, uh, graph paper, highlighters. Um, again, there's lists upon lists of um, supplemental aids and services that we can utilize. Next. Okay. Oh, go back, Cindy, one more. There we go. Um, so this is when it just talks about uh, augmentative and alternative communication. Um, there is a link to watch a video um, that we can add in the chat, I hope, um, through PBS Learning. And it just talks about um, methods used to communicate in ways that do not involve speaking or writing. We have many students who use an alternative form of communication, um, you know, be it uh, Dynavox or an iPad or something. Uh, the video shows a, a really great um, lesson in creative writing and that the student is using uh, augmentative and alternative communication device while doing it. Um, and he's using text to speech option um, my son, even though he he does have language and speaks, communicates so much better via typing or text message. Like you know, you get like a three word sentence from him, or he can text you a dissertation. So remember that this is part of your supplemental aids and services, and it's just about communication. And communication does not have to be verbal. Go ahead. Related services, um, you know, we talk about transportation, speech, language, uh, occupational therapy, physical um, therapy, mobility. Um, a related service is also transportation. Don't forget about that for ESY. You know, I have some students that don't utilize transportation um, during the school year, but need um, the related service for extended school year. So remember, if your child needs transportation, this is also a related service. Again, um, there are other services other than the ones listed here below. Right, next section of the IEP. Cindy, we're stuck. There we are. Cindy's got a slow mouse. Um, supports for school personnel is the next, I love this section too. So this is uh, further down in your IEP, it supports for school personnel. Um, I love giving information to my teachers. Um, I love suggesting trainings that my school district can use, right? For example, trainings on use of positive behavior supports, um, you know, use of specialized adaptations to classroom environment. Also, don't forget supports for school personnel, training if your child's using an augmentative communication device or some kind of other assistive technology, don't take for granted, we all know how to use that, right? So um, training for those. So those supports for school personnel can be really, really important when it comes to supporting your child um, in his everyday education. Next. Remember when Cindy went over um the 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 process right and we said these things have to be done first right so we have to have the via evaluation we have to put the iep together and so now that the iep is together now is when we would talk about educational placement um so again the annotated iep which we put in a link earlier is the deeper dive into the sections of the IEP, um, they're gonna ask four questions, right? We wanna ensure that um, the team is given adequate consideration to the student's placement in general education. Remember, he doesn't have, your student doesn't have to earn their way in to general edu ed education, right? We wanna start in mind, right? beginning with the end in mind, that we are going to be in general education with all the supplemental aids and services that our child requires to be successful in that placement. And only then, after we have exhausted those, are we moving down the continuum. The school district um, has to have a continuum of placements, but we should always be starting at general ed and answering the questions of how 
will my, partic will my child participate? Not if, how will he have access to general education? And that was my next slide. See, I'm one step ahead of you today, Cindy. And it is not whether the child will have access to general education curriculum, but how will they have it? And I'm going to stop right there so we can answer any questions, uh, any kind of discussions that we may need to have. Again, don't worry if they don't all get answered right here and now um, i'm going to add my email to the chat and he's going to add hers again we have info at peelcenter.org if you have any other questions um, before we get started though i want to kind of make a plug for um, next friday the 19th we'll be having a, a webinar with carol clancy um, we'll also add that link in the chat too all righty questions anyone 